Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tight to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard. Serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who uh, persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Verse 17, never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you're honorable. Do all that you can do to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay back, says the Lord. All the people of God say, amen. <laughs> it's good to know that some folks will get their comeuppance, right? But he says, don't you do that. Verse 20, instead, if your enemies are hungry, do what? Feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will be heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Just take a journey through the action verbs here. He says, love others, hate wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Take delight. Uh, work hard. Don't be lazy. Serve enthusiastically. Rejoice. Be patient. Keep praying. Bless your enemies. Be happy. Weep. Don't be proud. Don't retaliate. Live in peace. All of these things that he speaks of in this one passage. It's just like a kind of a smorgasbord of relational and a attitudinal checkups for each and every one of us. You know, I've, this pastor tells a story about a seminary professor who spent 40 years teaching seminary, and one of, one of his main subject was teaching the, the Christian graces of love and patience and forgiveness and forbearance and so forth. Well, once he retired, he busied himself making improvements on his house, and one day he went out and poured a new concrete driveway and it was all finished pretty much he was exhausted he went into the house and sat down with some tea to rest and then when he went back outside he saw the neighborhood kids were putting their footprints in his new driveway well, he chased them down in a rage you know he got mad and he caught the ones he caught he just beat the living tar out of them his wife she hears the commotion she comes out she just, you know, she confronts him. She grabs him, takes him into the house, says, can't believe you've done this. For 40 years, you taught um, the graces of forgiveness and forbearance and patience and all that, and mercy and grace and, and favor. And, and now you've just ruined your testimony. He told her, he said, well, that was in the abstract. This is in the concrete. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I want to talk about loving not just in the abstract. I want to talk about loving in the concrete, you know, where the rubber meets the road. So I have three questions I've asked myself this week. I want to ask you the same questions. I want you to ask yourself these questions. Number one, do, do I genuinely love others? Number two, do I bless my enemies? And number three, do I make peace, my peacemaker or a peace breaker? Let's go to the first one. Do I genuinely love others? How much I show my love to others? Paul says uh, here, don't pretend, but really, really genuinely love others with true love. Sometimes we tolerate people and we call it love. We just, uh, I heard one guy say one time, well, I love them. I just don't like them. <laughs> God told me to love them. He didn't tell me to like them. And I, I don't know. I, I, there's a, such a thin line between like and love there. Sometimes our personalities clash or there's something about somebody that's offensive to us. But he says, love others with genuine love, even the difficult ones. John 13, 35, Jesus said this, they're going to know you're my disciples because you love 
one another. Not because you're, you operate in all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Not because you can quote a lot of scripture. But because you can love. And because you do love. And what I'm grateful for is that all of Christ's commands are accompanied with the power to perform. You know, uh, sometimes the kids do get their feet into our wet concrete. And uh, what do we do about that? I, I know what I do. I have to appeal to the love that comes from God. You know that for all of us here, outside of the love of God, the love that he gives, uh, it would just be totally impossible for us to love like Jesus loves. But see, here's the thing. Every time Jesus commands us to do something, he also gives us the power to do it. As a matter of fact, he doesn't command us to do anything that we could do on our own. He commands us to do those things that only we could do by his love. Romans 5.5 5 says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God, see that? The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You know, a lot of years ago, I gave my life to the Lord. The first thing I noticed is I loved people. Uh, my parents made me go to church. I didn't like any of those. I just did not. It, I didn't love them. I didn't like them. I didn't care for them. I didn't tolerate them. In fact, I antagonized a few of them. And uh, But boy, I'll tell you what. Well, the night that I gave my heart to the Lord, I started looking at people a totally different way. I loved everybody. I remember we were driving home and we took somebody back to their home that night that had come to church with us. And, and I remember there was a dog, just a mangy old mutt out there. Poor thing, a homeless dog. And I remember I thought, I love that dog. I just loved everybody. I could hug the fire hydrant. I could hug the telephone pole. I just loved everybody. That comes through. The love of God. There was a four-year-old boy whose family lived next to an elderly gentleman who had recently lost his wife. And when he saw the man cry, he went across the lawn and he went into his yard, climbed up in his lap. And he just sat there. And a few minutes later, he came back. His mother said, what did you tell him? He said, I didn't tell him anything. I just, I didn't, I just helped him cry. And so sometimes that's what we, we do. We just, you know, love is something that is expressed. It's, it, when you love, you love out loud. Love is not just something in the abstract. It's something that is in the concrete. Second question that I've asked myself, and uh, here's where we're going to step on all of our toes, I know. I know, because somebody cut me off in a black Corvette yesterday. And I had my nephew, Joshua, in the car with me. And I'd just been telling Joshua, Joshua, I'm glad you're driving. I'm going to let you drive this car so that you can know how to drive an SUV and so forth. And we're talking about that. Then the guy cuts me off. And I got mad at him. I apologized to God after that. Apologized to Joshua. And Joshua said, it's okay. I was thinking the same thing. But, um, you know, at the moment, you can treat somebody like an enemy. But as my son always reminds me, Dad, they may come to church on Sunday morning, so you need to make sure you don't do that. But I honked at him, <laughs> and I didn't just beep. I honked. There's a difference in a beep and a honk, and I honked. <laughs> Let me give you five reasons why we should bless those who curse us, bless those who are enemies. Number one, it is the way of Jesus. It's the Jesus way. Talk about the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It is the kingdom manifesto. He calls us to live out principles in life that are different from the principles of the world. And he says, you've heard the law that says, this is in verse 43, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And so he says to us, you know, when you do this, you're emulating God himself. You're being like God. The Father, being like the Father. In that way, verse 45, you will be acting as true children, true, true children of your Father in heaven, for he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. Have you ever thought about that? And he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you only love those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. 
You notice that? I mean, the mafia loves people. You ever watch The Godfather? And they're kissing each other all the time. They love each other, you know. And then go out and kill people. Verse 47. If you're kind only to your friends, how are you different than anyone else? Even the pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. That word perfect does not mean flawless, although with God it is. But for us, he's saying you're to be separate. You're to be holy. That word is attached to the word holy. You're to be a separate person. Don't act like the word. Don't do like the world does. Second thing, second reason why I should bless those. God shows extraordinary long-suffering to those who are walking in ignorance. You know, today, someone may be resistant to the gospel. They may be somebody that you would deem an enemy to the gospel, but tomorrow they could be a hero of the faith. Why? Because God would already be working on them. My friend, Thousand Abraham, invited me to go to India a few years ago. This was the first time that I went there, and he introduced me to somebody. Valson's, Valson's grandfather started a church organization, started with the Church of the Brethren, and then it became, and then he, he, he started his own group, and it was an indigenous Indian church group. They have planted thousands, actually tens of thousands of churches throughout India, all of Asia, and uh, he invited me to come speak at their national conference in Kumbhanad, Kerala, which is in South India. And so one day, it was just a marvelous opportunity and a wonderful, awesome experience. And we're out there, he said, I want you to meet somebody. And so uh, he, he brought in this, uh, this old man who was just a little old fellow. And he was about that tall, and he was just, he had this huge smile on his face, just a real thin guy, probably weighed about 70 maybe 65 pounds, you know, he says. And so he began to explain to me who he was. He could not understand because he speaks Malayalam. He doesn't understand English. But I greeted him, and then he said, this man lives across the street from the compound. They have a Bible school compound there. They put up this huge arbor. Twenty-five to 35,000 people gather in for the night services for this conference. And he said, this man here, when my grandfather was starting this church, he opposed him. He was the head of the Communist Party here in this region of Kerala. And one night he had a dream. And in that dream, the Lord came to him and said, you need to go to Mr. Abraham and ask him to pray for you. And he said, so our chief opponent, the one who opposed us the most, became a Christian and was baptized. And of course, there he is just smiling, all smiles. And we, we, we had some fellowship there together. You, you never know what somebody's, what's going through somebody's heart. You never know what will happen. And that's why we should show love to those who even uh, oppose us. And so 1 Timothy, the first chapter, here's what Paul is saying. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, Paul says, I was all of that. I was a blasphemer. You know, if you're on the Christian side, you'd want to take me out. I was shown mercy, he said, because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Even though he had been a persecutor and somebody who was accused of murder. And see, for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who believe on him and receive eternal life. So that's a good reason to love people is because you never know. You know, the bigger they are, they say, the harder they fall. Number three, when we bless, a blessing is returned to us. We talk about sowing and reaping a lot of times. That works here as well. First Peter 3, 9, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. You know, my daddy can beat your No, my daddy can beat your daddy. No, my daddy can beat your daddy. But with blessing. Because to this you were called so that you might inherit a blessing. I don't know about you, but I want to inherit a blessing. I, I want my life to be blessed. Now, I've been up, I've been down, I like up. And I like the blessing. I like the favor of God. He says here, part of receiving that blessing 
is, is sowing blessing to others. So later on, you know, I blessed that black Corvette. And you need to, and I need to, and we all need to be blessing those who curse us and not repay evil for evil. You know, most of you are in the workplace in some fashion or the other. And, you know, there are all those malicious and persnickative people that you have to deal with. But I believe that if we try this out, I believe that if we put this principle into action, that we will see the blessing of God. And even if that person never does repent, God says, I'll see to it that you receive blessing. Because it's not cursing, or that word curse there in the scripture means blighting or putting down. But that word blessing means speaking favor over that person. Number four. Here's another good reason to love your enemies. Words of grace produce more good than harsh words of anger and frustration. There are certain times when we correct. Well, we do that in love. Look at Proverbs 15 and 1. A gentle answer turns away rash, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Because, see, you never know what somebody's going through. You never know the battle that a person is going through. You know, and rather than being critical, rather than seeing them in the line at the grocery store or maybe the one that's checking you out, and they just treat you like you're doing them a tremendous, or they're doing you a tremendous favor by being there. So I'm not coming back to this place again. Why don't we just pray for them and bless them and bless those who are going through a hard time? Because you never know what that blessing will do. And, you know, I remember one time going into the grocery line or, or some store, I forget where it was, and, and and everybody that was in front of me, you know, this lady, she was just, she she had been baptized in lemon juice. I mean, she was, she was just sour. And she was, she was being rude to, to everyone. You know, hurt people hurt people. And, and I, I thought, you know what? I'm going to practice something here. I'm going to practice what I preach. I'm going to bless her. So when I got to that, I said, how are you today? And she looked at me, first of all, kind of like I was crazy. Like, what, you, you talking to me? And I said, how are you today? And, and when, she, when she looked up at me, she realized I wasn't being sarcastic. She was probably expecting that. And she smiled right back, you know, kind of at least half, you know. She said, well, I've had a hard day. And then she told me a couple of the things that were going on. And I said, well, you know what? I'm going to be praying for you that all of that is taken care of. Look, tears coming down her eyes. You know, we're checking out everything. Let me have your card. All that, all that, all that's going on and just ministering, touching their lives. So, you know, words of grace, they'll produce more than, uh, <clears throat> you know, hard words of harsh words of anger and frustration. Number five. Number five, we break the cycle of anger and hatred. See, this was Paul's counsel to the Roman believers. Overcome evil with good, not with a retaliation. And then he draws from the Old Testament. This passage, Proverbs 25, 21. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And doing this, you will heat burning coals on his head. It's interesting here because Paul was a student of the Old Testament. Because of that, he drew from this Proverbs. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head, which kind of those of us who maybe want to retaliate, that's pretty good. Just burn, burn the sucker up. Just heap coals. However, that's actually a, a figure of speech because in the East in those days and even today, everything's carried on the head. And in those days, even the coals were carried on the head. And every home had a basin or a container uh, in the fireplace that, or in the place where they cooked uh, that you could be lifted up and carried about. It was, it was filled with coals. And it was actually kind of like a sign of prosperity if somebody could keep the coals burning at all times. You always had this spread of coals. 
And so if a neighbor was out, had, had ever getting ready to cook and everything, oh no, the fire's out. Well, let's go to the neighbor. Let's go get some fire. So they go to their neighbor and borrow not only food, but sometimes borrow some of the fire. And so they would put that on their little basin. Of course, you couldn't carry that around there. That would singe, singe your eyebrows. But they would lift it and put it on the head, carry it down the street. And so when he says heaping coals of fire on their head, it means heaping blessing on them. Heaping blessing on them. And if we heap blessing on others, we break that ugly, destructive cycle of the flesh. And we follow in the footsteps of the master who forgave those who crucified them. Him, who said at the time that he's being crucified, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And think of Stephen himself, the first martyr of the church. When he was being martyred, he looked up, he saw the Lord, and he said, Lord, forgive these people. Forgive these people. And forgive all of them. They really don't know. Don't lay this to their charge. I will take it. I'll take it on myself. And of course, there was one who was overseeing his, his stoning. And it was a guy by the name of Saul of Tarsus, a young theologian who was at a masterful understanding of the Old Testament, had sat under the feet of the greatest teacher of that time, a man by the name of Gamaliel. And he was the one who was watching the cloaks of those who were stoning, overseeing the whole thing. And I believe that it was Stephen's forgiveness of him that opened the door for God to reveal himself to this man, Saul of Tarsus, who became the great apostle Paul. Well, let me close this with the third thing. Do, do I make peace? Wherever I am, do I make peace in the home or do I break peace? Am I a peacemaker or a peace breaker? Not a peacekeeper, but a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers, Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I know that scripture because it's the first one that I ever learned. When I was four years old, my mother was my Sunday school teacher. I learned, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I was missing my two front teeth. All I wanted for Christmas was my two, I mean literally, the two front teeth. And so when I stood before the church, and uh, I could just see the admiring and loving eyes of my mother as I said, What did other people make it? For they shall be called the children of God. And the pastor got up, Say it again, Paul. What did other people make it? For they shall be called the children of God. Before microphones, you know. Say it again. So they loved that. They wanted me to do it the next week. I thought they were loving the scripture. They were loving hearing me talk with that will with in my mouth. Little did I know that that first scripture that I would learn and memorize at the age of four, you know, would become my call in life. And Jesus says some of us are called to be peacemakers. Not peacebreakers, peacemakers. And not peacekeepers, but people who make peace. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's not the greatest calling. On the, sometimes, you know, you, you, you want to say, Lord, it would be so much more fun to kind of be on the polarization side of things, rather than trying to bring together, to get, get on one side and take pot shots at the other side. But for some reason, God calls us to be peacemakers. Not just me, but you and you and you and all of us. Peacemakers. Making peace in the home. I remember coming home one day, I was aggravated about something. Y'all are going to think I'm just a, a horrible guy by the time I get through here. But I, I'm using myself as an example. I, I didn't want to use Pat, so I'm using myself. I'm just I came home, and kids had just left all of the tricycles and bicycles in the yard, in the driveway. Made me so aggravated. So I, you know, I get out. I move them out of the way. Guys, you know how it is. We want to make a statement. You can peel rubber on your own driveway if you hit it and stop fast enough. And by the time I got in there, I could tell. We had a little dog named Slinky. It was a dachshund. And, uh, and when Slinky took a look at me and just kind of off like that, I knew 
Uh, even the dog was picking up on my spirit. And I went inside and Delia said, we were very peaceful until you showed up. <laughs> I said, oh God, help me. God, I've got to preach on Sunday. And so help me to be a peacemaker, not a peace breaker. I got with a couple of pastors one time. They got in an argument, doctrinal argument. And one of them was, they were arguing over whether the Holy Spirit was for us today or not. And I had, I sat down. I don't know what caused me to even desire to sit down at this table, but I did. And one was there and one was there. And they were back and forth, back and forth, like a tennis match, back and forth, back and forth. And uh, until finally one of them said, you, you do not have the Holy Spirit. Well, he said that. I knew this guy that he said that to better than the other guy. And I thought, he shouldn't have said that. Because this guy, he was a, literally a Marine sergeant, retired Marine sergeant, drill sergeant. And he kind of rose up out of his chair. Not all the way, but just enough. You know, like, on, like a cat ready to... And he said, you better believe I have the Holy Spirit. If I didn't have the Holy Spirit, <laughs> I would beat your toot -toot into this ground here. And I thought, Lord, we need you. And you know, I had to, I had to say, I say, Jim, you settle down. And uh, you settle down too. And let's just, you know, here we are. They were having a prayer meeting inside. and They were fighting over whether people could be healed or not inside we're in a hotel uh, lobby kind of thing and there's a banquet room there and some people are praying for people to be healed and now this argument doctrinal argument takes place i said you know guys what i'm hearing none of this is jesus and i want you to realize that you've got to go and meet your congregations this coming sunday what kind of spirit are you going to carry with you and uh and they've settled down and down and down and, you know, before it was all over with, I had them hugging each other. I, I don't think they ever agreed doctrinally, but that doesn't matter. What they did agree on is that they all loved Jesus. Blessed are, blessed are <laughs> the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Look at Hebrews, the 12th chapter, 14th verse. I close with this. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And to be holy. What is that holy word? That word is separate. Yes. Then I can live at peace. with that. I can make that my aim. To live at peace with everyone. And at the same time, maintain what God has called me to be. As far as being separate from this world. I believe that we live in a world that needs to see the other side of Jesus. A world that needs to see that side that is loving, that is caring, that cares for others, doesn't live for itself. That which breaks the cycle of anger and hatred, that which is blessing, that which is doing, that which he's called us to do. So I want us to pray today. And I'm just going to go back to something I said a couple of minutes ago. And that is that none of us can do this without the power of the Holy Spirit. None of us, the, the love of God is put into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And I just pray constantly, Lord, let there be a replacement here. Uh, let, let, let my attempts to do what is right be replaced by your power to do what is right in me. And the Holy Spirit comes not just to comfort us, but also to give to us the power to genuinely care for, genuinely love others, not in the abstract, but in the concrete. You see, we're all born into this world, unfortunately, sons of Adam. We carry that nature. But when we're born again, we take on a new nature. John 3 there was a man who was a teacher of the law. He comes to Jesus, a guy by the name of Nicodemus. And he says to him, Jesus, we know that you're a teacher. We know that you've come from God. And then he says to him, Nicodemus, in order for you to see and to enter the kingdom of God, you need to be born again. 
That which is flesh is flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. You can understand what I'm teaching when you're born again, when you're born afresh, when you're born anew. And the Apostle Paul took that a little further and he said, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, they are a new creation. So I've been born once into this world, but when I'm born again, my eyes are open. I see things differently. Yeah. And we love as Jesus loved. Maybe you've never given your life to him. Maybe you've never prayed this prayer. We're going to pray this prayer aloud, and I want everyone to join with me in this prayer time. But let's let this be a moment and a prayer of dedication. Lord, as we move into this fall, we want this to be a time when we genuinely connect with others with the love of God. Let's pray together. Follow me as I pray, okay? Just say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your power. I thank you that you give me power to love like I've never loved before. Open my heart, Lord God, to be a person who touches other lives through the power of Jesus. I take my life and give it to you. You come and be the Lord of my life. I will follow you all the days of my life. And I'll cause, I will, I will, I ask you to cause me to be filled with your spirit. And to walk with you from this day forward. I will be your disciple. And I will love you. And I will love those who you put in my life. I give you the praise. And I give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen.